Do you trust your crypto assets to centralized exchanges that actively sell your private information and front run your trades? Would you like to buy and sell your assets without any middlemen, intermediaries, or robots? Do you like paying slippage fees and having the price go up as bots steal from you on low liquidity decentralized exchanges? The solution is nodemarket.io set your guaranteed buy or sell price. No middlemen, no slippage, no bots ever. Buy or sell one, 10, or even 10 million tokens and you never have to worry. OTC trades are between you and the seller or buyer, guaranteed by audited smart contracts and no human middlemen. Nodemarket.io So interestingly, this is, I'm trying some kind of experimental stuff where I'm pushing this out on um, Instagram too. That's kind of cool. It's on Instagram, Manny. It's on Instagram, so that's neat. I don't think you can see just about anything, unfortunately, because it's like a little, it's like a little slice. It's a, it's a middle third. They're going to have to work on that maybe a little bit, but it's on there. So the six people on Instagram that know how to read, they could, they could tune in, maybe, if they can read. Um, yeah, so that's good. Um, I think, unfortunately, though, Instagram um, StreamYard doesn't aggregate Instagram comments yet. So there's that. Yeah. Seed of crypto knowledge. I like that. You know, today we're going to talk about all sorts of cool stuff. Okay, I'll get I'll get through some housekeeping stuff and then we'll get to the goods one the twin um the early the pre-tge twin tokens are done that is over with if you got it good if you didn't it then it is what it is uh you may many of you start receiving tokens today like today um brandon's gonna i think just watch gas prices and then those are gonna start going pew 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 sending out so that'll be good and then um, you will have them. He's going to do a video, which we'll post later, which is about adding the in twin token to your MetaMask account. So that's good. That'll be easy. These things are all easy once you get used to it. You just want to make sure it's not like a malicious, scammy, fake, bull crappy, you know, token. You want to make sure it's the real contract address. So we'll go through all that. We'll publish the contract address. We'll put it in the telegram chat for digital investor we'll put it in the telegram chat for private clients yeah for all that uh and matter of fact we're at 448 digital investors i think it's going to get a lot more this year probably because you'll get a lot of uh noobs rolling in so just you know it is what it is be aware of it um and then uh we're at 55 so we added one private client. We have one more, I think, is going to add here in the next few days. So that'll be, that'll be 55, almost 56. We're over halfway there on the private clients. Those things max out. Um, the reason there's like a, a thousand max on the digital investors and a thousand uh, and a hundred on the private clients is like there's only so many of us um, on the back end of this. And so beyond that, we don't think it makes sense. Um, as far as from a perspective of being able to give everybody enough attention, right? Okay, there. So that's why there's those limits are there. It's not like we don't like money. We're big fans of money. I love it, but you can only buy so many Starbucks coffees. Hmm. This is 
a chocolate foam cold brew, and it is so good because the people there know that I, I like a lot of the foam. It's probably more foam than coffee. They probably get me on that. It's probably like six cents a coffee. And it's like five bucks and 80 cents or whatever. I don't know. Anyway, one to nothing. You win, Starbucks. You win. Um, okay. Uh, the wrap up on the toad, <laughs> toad, the node market twin token. You say that fast. No market twin token launch. You're going to end up saying toad. Um, it was yesterday. So yesterday, um, what, they cut off for the um, to purchase the tokens. There was 1.6 million. It went out 15 cents. The last ones we cut that off last night. So. Those of you that get your tokens, you'll see a listing. The reason there's not a current listing, if you go over here to Node Market, for those of you that haven't gone around here and just banged around, there's a lot of stuff you're about to be able to do as we deploy more stuff. Um, but on from the exchange side, you'll see Twin. And it'll be in Twin. You'll see that listed among these assets uh, here pretty soon. So that's good. Um, yay. And then... Uh, you'll be able to do both sides. This is the, one of the things that we're doing is both the buy side and the sell side, which you might think, okay, but if you don't do custody, how do you, for those of you that really know kind of how these exchanges work, most exchanges work by holding um, assets in, in uh, um, some percentage of hot and cold wallets. Um, yes. If you get an NFT today, and you will get the you will be part of the January payout. Yes. And we may um we may extend that by seven days just because a lot of people were focused on the twin launch, which is going to be very exciting. So those are kind of two disparate things. So let me let me clear up this thought. One, right now you see that there are sell orders. You can go and look. Let's say I want to buy some hypercycle. Cool. I go in here and I look at all the offers. You see buy, 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 buy. Okay. These are sellers um, that are selling tokens. This is wallet to wallet, meaning none of these transactions ever touch, ever touch an exchange. They don't ping any APIs. They don't affect any decentralized exchange or DEX prices. You could sell 100 million tokens here for one penny. It would have zero effect on the rest of the market. You shouldn't because that's stupid, but you could. And we do that. This is for many reasons. One, we live in the in Web three. If we're in Web three, where we have where the whole point of crypto is not to trust centralized third parties, then why the fuck does everybody want to get listed on and be Coinbase? Coinbase, yeah, no, man, no. That's the that is the opposite. That's just another bank. It's a horse of a different color. It's the same thing. It is a centralized, no different than Fidelity, no different than any of these other crappy. I mean, it is what it is. They hold your stuff. And it's usually in a percentage. They'll have some of it in a cold wallet, 10 to 50. Well, it's supposed to be 10 to 20% in a hot wallet, meaning banging around on the exchange, which is attackable. And then, you know, 70 to 80 to 90% in a hot in a in a cold wallet where it can't be accessed, hopefully an air-gapped cold wallet, right? None of this stuff would mean mu much to most of you. The, the, the long story short is all of these exchanges that keep getting pilfered, and I'm not, I like Coinbase actually, but it is not Web3. You can buy Web3 assets and move them into Web3 wallets like MetaMask and things like that, but Coinbase in and of itself is a legacy financial institution. It's no, it's got the word coin in it, and that's about it. It is the, it's exactly the same. So the idea is that if we live in a Web3 world, we should have a Web3 buying and selling experience, which is what Node Market is. It allows you to go wallet to wallet with no custody agent. The only thing that sits in the middle is a smart contract that says if you're selling these tokens, I'm going to lock them up until you either cancel that order or somebody puts money or whatever asset you want in place of the current one. If you want, if you want currency units USDC for your XYZ coins and you put that order in there, a smart contract holds those tokens until someone either puts USDC in there and they then there's a swap. But at no point does any custody agent, there's no humans in the middle. 
There's no fat, rich white dudes suckling on the, and also no one to steal your shit. So that's the whole point. So, but what we noticed is, okay, great. If there's a bunch of sell orders, but what about if you want to go the other direction? So to make it look more like a traditional exchange, that experience to have a, a, a buy side and a sell side, you'll be able to list offers to sell, say USDC and receive hypercycle or receive twin tokens or receive singularity DAO, whatever it is. Does that make sense? And then it's going to be called an ordered book. This does not exist anywhere. So it's going to take a little getting used to this. Is something that is new is new. So it's going to look like an order book that you might see on a centralized exchange. The difference is we're not managing custody on those assets and playing market maker and all that bullshit. Those, the orders in red are all sellers selling an asset in some terms of some other asset, like selling hypercycle for USDC. On the bottom, it's people selling hypercycle, well, selling USDC for hypercycle, which is a buy order, right? You're selling your fiat currency for, which is not fiat anymore. It's a fiat proxy because it's a stable coin, but you're selling stable coin for the asset that you want. The benefit of that is you can then put orders in for the price you want to purchase at. So while this may sound a little wonky, it's going to let everybody have a much easier, a much visually or mentally easier experience. So there's that. All right. So that's what we're doing with that. Okay. Um, to, let me see, let me get through some final housekeeping, housekeeping. Okay. So the, the twin token thing that's over with, actually, I think I need to find a new, I need to adjust this. So the twin launch is the cutoff date was yesterday. Those tokens will be disseminated here in the next day or two. The new contracts, the gasless contracts for node market will deploy in the next days, maybe tomorrow, but, but in the next three, four or five days, which will mean that you'll be able to set up transactions and you're not going to have to pay Ethereum fees to list Ethereum fees to cancel and all that. What would it would be one Ethereum fee when the transactions pinged on the blockchain, everything else is code based. So again, it's just making the experience easy for everybody that's banging around on node market. This should be your wallet and their wallet, either the wallet you're buying from or the wallet you're selling to with nobody in the middle. You got to get humans. I mean, we love humans, but be honest. Do we trust humans? No. Most people are corruptible. It is what it is. If the, if the, if the amount of zeros is big enough, you will create some corruption. Don't, what is it? The, the saying, don't make a thief out of an honest man, right? Like, come on, man. So, we want to make the experience two wallets, one piece of code, as simple as possible and no simpler. All right. So with the um, with the node market NFTs, let's talk about that just for a second, and then we'll get on to your questions. You have, I think we're going to extend that period by a week because everybody's been kind of focused on the twin launch, which went good. There's like 600,000 tokens. That was it. I mean, all except for like just a few got got snatched up. And so they will start to, they'll get listings. They'll start to appear. Now, I would urge many of you, keep, keep this in mind. You're going to have, when Twin starts rolling out all of their early phase, because this is kind of like tokens for the original, the new early adopters. They want to get many hundreds of Twins built. And so there's going to be a benefit to having these tokens. One, you can seed your wallet. You'll, you'll have like a vault. I don't know what they're going to officially call it, but I think a twin vault. Because operating a twin, operating anything in AI, has a bunch of compute costs, your vault has to be funded because the company has to perform a shitload of transactions all the time to maintain the live the liveliness of your twin right if, think about it if the, if your twin is leveraging large language models large multimodal models and all of your data that you've used to create this twin just like a human needs to consume some calories you got to feed your twin some calories 
right, in the form of twin tokens. So it is it is a utility token. I kind of think of it like food. It's like twin tokens are food for my twin, which is being which we're be, we're developing right now. So you'll have a vault with a bunch of encrypted data with access to all these LMMs and LLMs and and whatever you know neurosemantic learning engines and all that whatever the next phase of all this is. It will leverage all that stuff. So your twin will be the best combination of everything that's available and then you, which is really cool. My twin's going to be good as hell at math. So um, as this is all going on, you have to have a pool of twin tokens in your vault to keep your twin funded. Makes sense. We don't know what the number is. I don't know. My guess is like 2,500 or something like that. That seems to be like a number that's kind of popular in the in the crypto world is like 2,500. Like at Singularity DAO, you have to have 2,500 tokens um, to be a part of like certain like drops and all this kind of pre-listing stuff. Anyway, point is, I don't know what the number is, but I'm guessing it's something like that. The benefit of having the tokens early is if they do start to get hoovered up, then you would have not paid a lot for them. And I think the the value of having, like, if you go get a chiropractic treatment in LA, it's like 85 bucks, right? So for two chiropractic, two, for two or three chiropractic treatments, you funded your twin. Like you, you got your neck popped, which I don't even know if that does anything, but you got your neck popped three times, great. Thanks, Doc, Doc. Those guys are called doctors, please. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, um, so I guess the point to all that is it's it's a very small amount. And then if you ever unwind your twin, if you just decide, hey, I don't want to pass this on to my progeny or I don't want this kind of digital, you can just unwind your vault and put the tokens and go dump them or whatever. But I don't think... That doesn't make sense to me. I think it's kind of a one-way gate. I think as you're building your twin and you're building the your personality and the dexterity, and for many of you, you're going to be putting that twin out there to like earn you revenue and things like that. If you're on the revenue side of it where you want to go generate income, um, well then, like especially for many of you that are consultants or um, – and I was saying the other day, I have a buddy who's um, uh, at Netflix. I can't say what he does because that would probably give it away. Um, but he does a bunch of big shows and he handles a lot of money and he's thinking, you know, I could train my twin to do a lot of the tasks that I train some of the newer accountants to do, or the CPAs that come in and jump on the team that have to handle, you know, like a variety of things like task based, you know, go out and find out what the, what the cost per person per whatever in Albuquerque, New Mexico is, if they're shooting for, you know, 13 hours a day and all this kind of stuff. So he could essentially imbue all the, those kind of thoughts, ideas, questions, and tasks into his twin and have that twin going out and doing a lot of the rudimentary work that he would normally be doing. Now, I know that's not day one, but like he's thinking I can build a twin and have an assistant. So he's doing a twin for an assistant, which is kind of cool. And I thought, well, if you build that up and it's a good assistant, other shows might want to leverage that. And that's when they pay you money. So there's all sorts of ways where as you're building a twin, I think you might end up building something that someone else could get some value out of. And then on and so then you monetize it. On the other side of it, many of you would probably just like to build this twin as something to pass on to your progeny, to your kids, grandkids, whatever. For me, for my cats, kitties. The cats have to be able to chat with me at all times, 24 hours a day, all the time. So that's another that's another use case for those of you that have cats. All right. So that covers the twin stuff. <clears throat> so it looks like okay, now to put a button on all this, the node market NFTs get you a 21% rev share in the uh all the revenue that the exchange makes. Node market makes revenue, you get a piece of it. And so uh that is 21% the the date was going to be um, the 20, sorry, sorry, the fifth cutoff date. I think we're going to extend that by one week just because we've been kind of messing with all of the twin launch stuff. So, whew. Okay. Um, let's spend a few minutes 
uh, on some of your questions and answers, and then we will get to, we're going to talk game theory as it, game theory, cognitive bias, and a, maybe a slightly deeper look at um, Nash equilibrium in our regular lives. Woo woo. Yeah. And we're going, and by the way, we're going now, um, we're going to be working with um, some friends of ours in the digital private clients and looking at um, a, attaining some patents and IP protection for a lot of the things that we're doing since there is no other web three kind of exchange like this. And so, you know, anytime you can line up a bunch of patents, value up. Yay. Okay. Um, Arlen asks, Nick, is the buy request set up now in node market? No, it's not set up yet because that's going to come out with the gasless contracts. And the visual experience we're trying to create is something that looks more like a regular. It's it's going to be called an ordered book, not an order book. Normally on exchange, you see an order book. You see all the red. Uh, you see a red column up above and a green column down below and the prices meet in the middle. And the green column are the buy orders and the red column are the sell orders. And those are all the sellers on the bottom are all the buyers. And in the middle, um, the difference between the lowest sell price and the highest purchase offer, the bid ask spread, right? That's uh, that, that little spread there in the middle is usually the last market price. Since this is web three, there's no last market price. There's just the, there's just going to be a spread between, uh, seller asks and buyer offers. Does that make sense? So bids and asks. Ergo, there will be a bid ask spread, but you'll be able to just look at it. We want it to be visually easy because um, a lot of people have some market experience, but the idea of having complete control and sovereignty over their assets, it's a lot. And so we want to make that experience a little bit easier. So that will roll out when the gasless contracts roll out here in you know, days. We originally thought this would be available um, before uh, the 25th, um, but I guess, you know, some people have holidays and things like that, which is weird because Web3 never has holidays, but yeah. Okay. So that is that. Um, let's see. Can't AI be corrupted if program two? Well, I'm sure if what you put into it is what your inputs determine your assets uh, or your, your, well, your, your, your outputs. But like if you're building a digital asset and you input a bunch of corrupted crap, you probably have a corrupted entity. However, I think if you look further down the line, I think there's going to be a lot of AI based gatekeepers that look at what you're doing and make sure it's not bad. And there'd be there'd be all sorts of ways to do stuff like that too. Um, and yeah, uh, there's a good chance. Well, I don't know. This has been mentioned. Is that there's a possibility that you would run um, your twin potentially um, on a hyper on a hyper AI box or something like that. You could maybe power it. There, there would be all sorts of ways where hypercycle and twin have a lot of synergy. So that'd be interesting. There's, I don't know. I know that they're in, they're talking, they're in discussion. I don't know how far that's gone, but I'm, I'm sure that because hypercycle provides compute AI to AI compute, that it would make a lot of sense for them to work together. Let's see, Pam asks, do you see, uh, or can the SEC U S government stop U S citizens from using MetaMask? No, and no more than they can stop sunsets. Can it prevent us from using node market? No. Um, there's nothing to prevent you from using. These are all wallet to wallet transactions. No different than you making a transaction between your own wallets. There's nothing to, there's nothing. And the reason is because we don't do custody. We don't hold your assets. This is just a place where you can find other people that have assets to offer up. There's no, that's, that's kind of the beauty of a situation like this. Um, it's just a wallet to wallet transfer, which is great. Um, it means we don't probably make as much money as we would uh, like with a centralized exchange, but you don't have to worry about anyone stealing your shit, which is so good. Uh, let's see. Um, would you be able to populate your twin with other people's knowledge? Yes. 
um, in, in different percentages. It depends. There's going to be people that make all sorts of amalgams. I think you're going to see a lot of that. For instance, companies that have a web presence, which who doesn't? Um, they might have a helper bot or or like a a little chat, little chat customer support bot. I'm guessing those suckers are going to be high powered, amped up, bad mofos with a lot of a lot of um, input from whatever the the source, you know, kind of knowledge or like the expertise in that specific thing for that website. So whatever service they're offering. I'm sure that the subject matter expertise will be heavy for that like chat bot entity or for, and also it'll be a lot easier because you may be able to just talk to it instead of like click on the thing. And you're always like agent. I want an agent. Give me a human agent. I'd rather be like, Oh, humans are so stupid. Give me the AI agent. I want to, I want an AI agent. Anyway. Uh, let's see. Is twin secure meaning if you use it to store private info? Yeah, so it encrypts all of that stuff. And, and the twin team can't even get to it. So that's the whole idea behind your vault is that what goes in the vault is yours. And no one can it – just, it's just you. No one else can use it. So that's cool. Uh, let's see. Can we just hold the tokens? Yes, you can just hold the tokens. Lisa, this is Web3. You can do whatever you want. Hmm. You can do whatever the hell you want. Will the tokens be consumed in the process? Um, I don't know what that's like. I think there's going to be just a certain amount. I mean, there probably will be some consuming of the tokens because if you're running tons and tons of, of requests for compute or your twin is having to run tons of compute, there's costs associated with that. Like, you know, if you have a computer – and it's plugged into the wall. It's not on all the time, but when it is, it's using a little bit of electricity. If you unplug it, eventually the power goes down. You like you've exhausted the the electricity stored in capacitors. So at some point you would need to probably replenish. Um, but it depends on your use. And it's also going to be pretty minimal. I mean, if you think of it, God, I pay whew, I think I pay two thirty a month. For, for the gym, for Equinox. I think about the things that I pay for. It makes me, it makes me wonder about the value. But then again, on the other side of it, like a gym membership, not to get off on a side note, but a gym membership paying like a monthly thing makes you go use it. You're like, God, damn, I got to get in four days a week if I'm paying this much. Holy smokes. Um, it, this, this will not be that. Um, and also, there's a good chance that if you have a twin that's out there just earning revenue, then it would just take a piece of that revenue for any kind of, you know, back end replenishment. But this is something that's going to be active and it's going to be constantly working with different AI machines and banging all over the, you know, whatever the multiverse looks like or, or, the, or just the regular internet. But, it, but it's something that is going to require some maintenance. Um, will you be able to populate your twin with other people's? Yeah, we already cut. We already got that. Yes. Um, what security protocols will we use to protect twin? Um, I don't know about all their super secret stuff in the back, in the back end. I know that they're going to also be, it looks like working with hypercycle about protecting the, your, I, the twin identity as far as it's, um, that's part of a project. I think a copy Raider, um, which is a side project that hypercycle is also involved in, uh, where it's protecting AI copyrights. Um, because there's nothing to protect AI copyrights, but there should be because there's a lot of times where you work with AI and you create something that's never been created for and you deserve goddamn copyright. So um, copy Raider is, was kind of built for that purpose. So that's kind of cool. And that's like recognized by like 40 countries now. So sweet. All right. Uh, let's see. Um, this option is going to be great. It's almost like setting up a negotiation. Yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, thank you guys. Oh, yay. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, buddy. Uh, the amount of consideration you have for his investors. Well, listen, it's it's for you guys, but it's also for us. Like the way Brandon and I start building and concepting things is we look and say, okay, do we need to do X, Y, Z? Why? Where can we go do X, Y, Z? Why does it not exist? 
All of the stuff that we've built is because other people just refuse to build it or they're too fucking lazy. That's mostly what we see. And for years, I can't tell you how many ideas that we've had and we ask around and people are like, oh, that's too difficult. That's too, I'm like, why is it too difficult? It doesn't seem like it's too difficult. I mean, if you throw enough money at any problem, it's no longer too difficult. <laughs> it turns out that is that has been what we've learned. No problem is too difficult if you throw money at it, if you're willing to just fire hose money at the problem and also be good, hire good devs and fire them. Like if they, when they f start failing, you got to just dump them and find other people because yeah, you can't be afraid to fire people, I guess. We're pretty good about that. We've only had the fire like, well, it doesn't matter, but you know, you, you can't fall in love with your developers. Um, because pretty soon you won't, it'll just be AI. You wouldn't feel bad about firing an AI and using a different AI, right? So it's the same thing. Like you could do, man, you can code solidity contracts. You can get, you can get GPT four turbo to write solidity contracts. You can get turbo and you can get, um, Claude two to do a basic audit before you send it to an auditing team. Yeah. Pretty soon there just won't be humans involved. And then building stuff will just be like, okay, this doesn't exist. I want to build it. This doesn't exist. I want to build it. And then it'll just be nuance, fine tune and nuance. Why is all these salesy assholes called right now? And it's always that same recorded thing. Hey, have you? No, man, shut up. I always wait until the person gets on the line. I'm like, agent, you know, I just keep saying agent. And then the person gets on the line. And I tell them to kill themselves. And then I hang up. Is that wrong? Is that wrong of me? Maybe. Uh, okay, can we get an update schedule on hypercycle marriage compute? Don, buddy, do, do you think that I would know it before the, the team at hypercycle knows it? If they haven't released anything specifically, it, does, it is not there yet. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I know that compute starts in March. So if compute starts in March and we're in January... That means uh, I know this. I know the 1155 token. The token is done. The the hyper share token is done. Audits back, clean everything. They're working on materials so that people can onboard. They can they can marry their tokens. They can point at pools and all that kind of stuff without having to go to 20 different websites. They're trying to clean all that up and to just have one experience. And they don't want to get a bunch of people out there sending their tokens into freaking hyperspace. Uh, once twin starts to, to become built, will the twin token become scarce? Uh, well, I mean, I don't know. Scarcity is tricky. I know the hypercycle token is going to be scarce as a mofo. People don't realize just on that last little note on hypercycle. Um, there's like only two thirds, not even quite two thirds. There's only like 60% of the amount of tokens necessary to fill the licenses that have been sold. So basically, basically half, I think it's 0.57 or something. So point, so half. So meaning that if everybody wants to fill their licenses with tokens, only half can do it. So what do you think that's going to do to the price of the token? Like you can, you know, you don't need a napkin to do that math. The, the token is scarce. Um, in the early days of twin, yes. Like I'm kind of, my little two cents is I would encourage the team to release tokens to meet the demand of people that want to build the twin rather than flip the token, which will actually be accretive for the token. Because if you release the tokens, if you drip them out to society as they're needed to build their own twins, then you don't have a glut of tokens sloshing around on exchanges, watering down the price. If supply and demand are equal, you get to see what the real value is. And maybe the real value of this token is a buck. Maybe it's five bucks. Maybe it's 50 cents. I don't know. But when the amount of tokens going into develop nodes is equal to the supply that's, that's free floating, then you can see what people are willing to kind of offer up in order to develop their twin. And then as the twins become more robust, as their offerings become more robust, 
then um, that would go up to be based on utility. So there it is again, use utility and, and then the hope of wide scale adoption. For me, I mean, I don't really care if there's wide scale adoption. I'm going to build my twin. I'm going to monetize the shit out of it. I'm going to have it out there making me money all the time. Even if it's like little memberships, little, this is little, like to my, to my consulting clients. If I could have a twin that instead of them paying a thousand an hour, they might pay a hundred bucks for a year just to have my, my little snark um, available 24 seven when they have like basic questions. One that would solve a lot for me because I would have, I wouldn't have so many questions to answer, which is great because I'm basically a lazy person. I work really hard to be lazy. And then uh, two, they get access for really, really cheap and they have real time access for basic decision making. And obviously the better that twin gets, the more he could do. But my goal is to monetize that son of a gun. That dude's going to be working for me. There may be many of those dudes out there working for me. So, yeah, that's just the way I look at it. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, will node market ever go into this selling of NFT space? Uh, it's not something that we're particularly interested in. But remember, NFTs are going to have different meanings in the future. Non-fungibility is something that protects data, um, gives, gives data uniqueness. Um, and so if you take a piece of data, even like take a document and you digitize it and you, and you sign a, a unique serial number to it, unique digital elements, um, have a value. And so in that case, like for instance, um, manual, he has a company that does wine. They, 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 they like, they do all sorts of cool stuff. It's not like just wine, but you know, you could imagine where there were NFTs that represented different wines that might be stored in um, different vintage that might be stored in one of their kind of depository facilities where they kind of protect the wine and keep it cool. Like all that kind of cool stuff that you do with wine. And it might be interesting to just trade NFTs against that rather than the actual bottles and whoever owns the NFT owns the bottle. Like that's kind of common sense, right? But you could think you could extrapolate that for all sorts of things where there's an intellectual property value or a physical real world value where those two things are kind of aligned. Hell, really expensive shoes. Like you could have, uh, man, there's all sorts of things. So in that aspect, I don't know. It's not one of our plans. Really the only kind of NFT exposure we're looking at is the NFTs, the 1155s, and everything in and around the hypercycle ecosystem. So like when you go here and you go node market and you go explore nodes, there's going to be a full, this is, we're building it and we're waiting for the 1155 token, but there's going to be a full experience around the, um, the buying and selling and trading and management of your node licenses, the income they're generating, the selling, the buying, the trading, all that, and the ranking and all that kind of stuff. We can't do it yet because compute's not live and those 1155s aren't active uh, in, in a way that everybody can kind of mess with. Like we can split licenses and do all sorts of cool stuff right now, but there's no point um, because everybody's getting free tilling, which is a gift. And so we're not going to jeopardize that. We'll wait until it's time to marry tokens and then we'll pop all those suckers off. That's a long, that was a long answer to which about 60% of it was probably what you want. I have hypercycle staked in the unbonded vault on the BNB chain and the rewards dropped over 7% from yesterday. What caused such, what caused such a large drop could be because a bunch of people part tokens in there. Um, also remember the unbonded vaults, those are marketing. You're not staking. Just remember it's, you don't have them staked. You have them in the unbonded vault. There's no staking going on. You're not, Staking is providing security to the network, either indirectly through um, staking pools and validators or directly through some other mechanism. None of us are staking. There's no, there is zero, listen, listen, Linda, Linda, there is zero staking going on on Singularity DAO. It is all, that is marketing tokens. They, that's a form of marketing where you lock your tokens up. 
the supply is less. There's less token sloshing around and you get paid a reward. That reward is a marketing budget. No different than going and doing advertisements on Twitter or anywhere else. It's just kind of a normal thing um, in the in this ecosystem. And I like the idea of getting paid to wait, but it's not staking. And so um, they can sunset those pools whenever they want. Again, it's a marketing budget. So when it runs out, it runs out. Um, uh, are some companies now, not now, but there's testing going on right now. Um, and will they be in the future? That's Charlene. Think about how wide the scope of your question is. <laughs> it's kind of a question and kind of a statement and you're kind of right and kind of generalized. Yes. And yes. <laughs> um, okay. Is there enough hardware available for all the sold licenses? Yeah, there is a giant, I mean, giant. We were talking yesterday on a call about somebody had, I don't know how many thousands of H 100s um, that were purchasable and all this. Yeah. There's plenty of compute space out there. That's not going to be too hard. It's just going to be um, getting large facilities to um, onboard the software and, and rock and roll. Let's see if the hypercycle are not there to fill nodes, then where will they come from? They, they are released. There's like a daily release schedule. They, they, they're constantly um, released, but it's, um, it's a slow process. And the node licenses are sold freely and the tokens are released. So the tokens will, will always be, in my opinion, the tokens are the, uh, the bottleneck. And so there's seems like a pretty obvious arbitrage there, but you know, we'll see. Uh, yes, 1 billion cap on twin tokens, of which 10 million are going to be on the exchange, meaning uh, one, uh, 1%. We got 1%. You're a one percenter. It's kind of, um, okay, let me see if there's any other. You already have a spinning stamp. <laughs> exactly. You've got a spinning stamp, man. Uh, okay, and then we'll go over into our brain stuff. Why would Hypercycle, the company, not have enough coins? Um, doesn't it hurt? No. No. And no, the tokens are meant to release so that there's not a big pile of tokens that just get dumped onto the market all at once. They're meant to release slowly to build the network. Um, the reason they let people buy licenses in advance is because a lot of people are buying licenses because of what they're going to do in the future. So, uh, and as far as like the design considerations, the, the, mechanism design behind the company not spamming the whole universe with all their tokens it's very rarely that a company will launch in at least in the web3 way and release all of their tokens all at once matter of fact it kind of never happens because if you knew there were 2.147 billion tokens out there what do you care you'll get to it when you get to it so they release they try to release the tokens and grow the network with the supply of tokens in the, in an effective you know, elegant way. Um, I mean, those are all design considerations. You know, different teams do different things. This is the way they did it. But if you look at most of the launches, most of the competent launches, they don't just shower all their tokens out there. So, yeah. I mean, you know, Ethereum and Bitcoin are doing okay and all their tokens aren't out there, right? Bitcoin, not until 2140 will all the tokens be available. No one's saying, how come Satoshi didn't release all 21 million? It's not the way it works. They just chose not to. So there you go. Um, okay. Am I suggesting, I'm not suggesting shit in a public, uh, in a public venue. I suggest nothing. I suggest nothing, Don. Uh, you got to do whatever makes the most sense for you. Um, where can we get the hypercycle software that corresponds? Um, they're going to release all of that there. Um, I would go to the, um, make sure you're in the hypercycle telegram. Oh, but don't ever click any links in any telegram group, no links ever, but yeah, go, go to the hypercycle telegram, uh, join up for that because asking me, is this like one step removed? I think you just go there and ask the team directly to their face. Oh, real quick for all of you that were like, ah, this guy's falling out of Bitcoin is already over 44 again. So. You know, 
one or two days of chaos doesn't doesn't mean much. A lot of the other assets haven't super recovered, but Bitcoin seems just fine. Um, oh, did you guys think it's funny that Jihan Wu is part of that Matrix sport thing? He's one of the owners. He's like, we don't influence the decisions of our analysts. Bullshit. You want to know who Jihan – go look up Jihan Wu and his connections to Bitmain and all the other sketchy bullshit that he's been a part of. Uh, I mean, really sketchy. Like, I mean – to the to the order of like fist fights outside of a bank with his co-founders of Bitmain. Yeah. Go look it up. Jihan Wu. He is a he's another one of those absolute, I'll say it. He's an absolute piece of shit. The same level as Alex Mashinsky is a piece of shit. Good going to jail. Uh Do Kwan going to jail. Well, in jail. Sam Bankman fried chicken, jail. Uh Kyle Davies. And uh, Zushu, jail, jail, well, one of them's on the run. All of these assholes, jail, scumbags. He is another one. Just keep that in mind. So that was the guy that really, that his firm released a report that all the SEC, uh, uh, all of the um, people that filed Bitcoin ETFs, they're all going to get shot down and all this kind of stuff. And they're like, okay, I guess that could happen, but that would kind of go against everything that we're seeing from the U.S. Uh, from the from the U.S. SEC. I have to say that because there are SECs in other countries. Did you know that there are many Securities and Exchange Commissions? So anyway, he's he's garbage, and it looks like he's at the top of this steaming pile of garbage. Good old Jihan Wu. <laughs> uh, well, yes and no. People are taking that a little bit wrong. Here's what. This is the last bit we'll say on that. Um, the charges, the way it works in the federal system, yes, they're dropping the charges, but they use, they load them up on the other side in what's called the relevant conduct in sentencing. Go, go read about relevant conduct. So basically the way the federal government works is they've got this very clever scheme in the sentencing guidelines whereby you, you, are found guilty of this thing and that puts you at a certain level. And then they do, um, they do this interview with you. They just did. I think they just did it. Um, they do a pre sentencing interview. They just did it with Sam Bankman. You can go read about it. They look at his past, his criminal history, all his kind of like shenanigans, his damage to society. And then they look at the charges that pre sentencing re report or whatever creates a score like 29 or 43 whatever that corresponds to a category to a to a a section in the guidelines for sentencing and that limits what the judge can do the judge can sentence inside that 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 group that category so let's say you're a 41 okay the judge might say okay that's 100 months to 300 months in this range then you can go plead. I'm I'm sorry, Your Honor. I didn't mean to. And he'll go. You know what? I like you with your curly hair. I think you're okay. I'm going to give you a hundred months. Or I hate you with your curly hair. And both of your parents are scumbags and pieces of shit. And they are also thieves. And somehow they got away with all this bullshit. And um, and I'm going to give you three hundred months. What? But that's what the judge can do. Well, the other cases. That even though they were dropped, they count as relevant conduct to increase your score. So even though he wasn't found guilty of those, that's relevant conduct. So that can increase his sentencing. So he's not getting off. Who's getting off? This is the scam, Howard. It's not the be it's not that the charges are dropped. It's that all of those dirty fucking politicians don't have to show their face in court. They don't have to answer subpoenas. They don't have. That's the scam. The parents getting away with all this bullshit, his scummy ass parents, especially his dad, that's the fucking scam. The scam is not dropping the charge. This dude's going to do anywhere between 10 and 30 years, probably somewhere in the middle. The fact that all these other douchebags got away with it, that's the scam. That's the unfortunate thing is we don't get to see all of them come forward. We don't get to see all the little rats and, my, and roaches that are part of this. And so that's probably the corrupt part. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if his parents are going to get away with it. My, my guess is that when this stuff is exhausted, the, the bankruptcy is going to go after 
all of the stuff his dad got. His dad and his mom got a lot of stuff. They don't get to keep that. That's not a, while this bankruptcy is happening, they don't get to win while all of the creditors lose. Um, they're going to get sued into fucking poverty if, if, if the world works at all correctly. Um, and I think to a degree they used him. He's just not that smart. Um, if you've ever really listened to, to Sam talk, he's just not that smart. I've always been uncomfortable with how, how smart he was not. Like my roommate's at MIT. He's a professor of, of genetics and, and stem cell research at, at MIT. I know what the fuck I'm talking about with, with MIT like alumni. And, and like Sam is not a cut of that cloth. So like, I mean, man, um, anyway, um, let's switch gears. Uh, let us not cast fingers at other people. And listen, none of that, none of them, none of, none of nothing, none of that matters to us. Now the, the crypto space is way cleaner. It's way safer than it was. It's a better place with all of those assholes gone. Alex, just go through the whole list of scumbags. They're no longer here. Are there new scumbags? Yes. But now everybody's got their antenna up. Everybody's got their little antennas waiting for these douchebags. So, you know, we're in a we're in a better place. So just kind of be happy about that. Um he knew what was going on, but I don't think I think he believed his dad when his dad was like Everything's fine. Everything's fine, buddy. I think he's like, cool. That's why he's like playing video games and stuff all the time. Like he, he knew it's kind of like willful negligence, but anyway, let's forget about all that. Um, let's switch gears. We need to talk about some game theory and employing it in our daily lives. And then we need to talk a bit about Nash equilibrium. I will make sure it's no longer than 10 minutes. And then you guys can get along on your day. And tomorrow on Digital Investor, Brandon and I are going to be doing some predictions. Hmm. We're going to go through all the assets and give uh, end of summer, end of year predictions. It's going to be tasty as hell. But for now, um, we need to get to our uh, classroom stuff. Hello. You're late. But I'm giving you an A plus in confidence. Just doing what I gotta do. Extra credit. That was a great episode, by the way. Anybody that anybody that saw that episode, it was a it was a banger. Okay. Um, so today let's do let's mix a little bit of game theory, a little cognitive bias, and a little uh, uh, giving thought to employing it in our kind of personal lives. So a lot of you are like, okay, game theory is great for, for like trading and investing. No, no. This is the way you should be thinking, like thinking in life. This is the, this is the, well, listen, you can think at whatever way you want. This is, this is a way you can be thinking in life and buy back a bunch of time. I had already talked about a few days ago, how just employing game theory on basic stuff can save you about a month to two months, a year of time of like life like actual life. You think about that. So anyway, critical thinking and analysis, uh, emotional regulation, patience, adaptability and continuous learning, risk assessment and risk management, and being able to create long-term plans, goal setting, kind of waiting for things to, to bear fruit before you pull the trigger too quickly. So let's cover those. In game theory, every entity every player is trying to anticipate the moves of all the other players right we're it's the beauty pageant we're trying to guess what the other people are going to guess like who do they think is going to win the pageant we're going to go invest in the pageant so as an investor and also it, like in your personal lives you need to think you know you need to think several steps ahead like all the really good chess players right they're like i'm thinking two moves ahead they're like that dude's thinking 13 moves ahead buddy they're like oh shit why? Because he's thinking, what's the best possible move you could make? If you don't, then he's going to beat you much sooner. He, she, or they. Uh, anyway, um, you have to be aware of confirmation bias where you're only seeking information that confirms your, your beliefs that you already pre-held. Um, 
So keep an open mind, consider various kinds of outcomes before making basic decisions. Like just, you know, even simple stuff. Uh, man, let me tell you, this girl pulled some real bullshit today at Starbucks. I went in, I was ordering. She was behind me. She leaves the line. She goes and puts her keys on a table. This isn't Mastro's, man. You can't reserve tables. The way you get a table at Starbucks is because you're in line and you buy something. So she went and put her keys. She like reserved a table and then got like caught. I'm going to get black. And then and just, like I almost wanted to go flip that goddamn table over. But I thought, no, no, no. That is wrong. I will not do that. I had to employ emotional restraint and patience. And I even had this whole thing about how I was going to tell her like how ridiculous she looks. She's like dressed like a bird, like from 1992 and like, ugh, anyway, whatever. But I didn't because I had emotional regulation. Let's talk about that. So patience, patience is a key strategy in game theory. It's probably the one that it, it plagues most of us, which is what is the best move? Mostly nothing. The best move most always is wait and see. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm not worthy of a table. I had lemon loaf bread. I had lemon bread and coffee. Damn it. Little freaking stork. Little bird looking 1992 dress unflattering stork. I could just, and she had those beady bird eyes. I don't know. Maybe she's actually a bird and I'm looking at it the wrong way. Maybe she's a very evolved, uh, Ostrich, if I just missed it. Anyway, um, in investing, in, like, and also in your daily life, await once you've made your investment decision or you've made a decision, you want to um, w wait and see a little bit. Give yourself some time to wait and see. Let things play out, right? Your best decision was the first one you made with all of that information at your disposal, right? The, every decision after that is typically reactionary. There's people that – I know it's stupid. There's people that panicked out um, – they panicked out of Bitcoin and stuff like that over the last day or two. Well, you saw. I think the, the total liquidations over the last you know, 36 hours was $700 million. All gone. They're gone, bro. They are gone. They're not in the crypto space anymore. They are deuced out. Remember, it was 176,000 people, and that was the 600. I bet it's over 200,000 people. Poof. <laughs> but, and if they just sat there and did nothing, well, those idiots use leverage. But, like, people that just left, like, I'm, I'm out. I'm out. I'm not doing I'm not playing this game. Okay, then don't play this game. But you don't get the, you don't get the rewards if you don't play the game. That's the thing. Um, watch out for loss aversion where you end up being ruled by the fear of losing rather than the joy of or the, like the success of winning it, because it can make you overly cautious or overly rash. Remember patience doesn't mean don't make decisions. It means wait until you can form a very pragmatic decision. All right. So um, when you have this loss aversion, this, this kind of over fear of losing um, it, it can make you be, go from patience to a dis not making decisions at all, like period. And so that can, that's like a, a kind of analysis paralysis. So practice staying calm, practice main, making decisions based on logic and emotions should not have any part of your decision-making process. There should be zero emotion in any, in an investment. I'm not going to say zero invest, zero emotion in life because I mean, that's the way I do it, but you got to you got to have some kind of whatever life where you're allowed to spaz out and and yell at the TV when the when something doesn't happen that you thought was supposed to happen. I don't know. Um, you need to be adaptable and you need to be continuously learning. So, games constantly change. Obviously, so you must right. You have to kind of adjust and evolve with the times. Um, and this is the essence of evolutionary game theory, where players will adapt to their strategies over time based on their successes, realizing that with each success, the game will change a little bit, right? And so you have these adaptive strategies. Um, be very wary of status quo bias, status quo bias, which is preferring things to stay the same. 
um, or or believing they're the same when they are clearly not, you know, like that octogenarian that won't like, no, over my cold, dead body. Yeah, well, probably will be. Anyway, um, embrace change and learn from it and evolve in your personal and academic life. Also, if you think, if you see th things in society changing, you might say, oh, they're changing for the worst. They're changing for, who cares, man? They're just changing. Just get all that, all that other baggage and just toss it to the side. It doesn't matter why things, oh, if it's a woke culture and all this people, and all people are stupid. Yeah, so what, man? Like, so what? You're not stupid. So it doesn't matter what the world around you, matter of fact, the dumber everyone gets, the, the more, <laughs> the more far right and far left and galvanized all these idiots get, cool, let them focus on that. We'll focus on arbitraging all of the stupidity in the middle and getting and getting like ridiculously wealthy in the process. So what? Let them fight over stupid shit. Let them say stupid shit. Let them watch stupid shit. People want to watch reality, housewives, the orange can, all this kind of stupid shit. They want to spend their life watching someone else's fake life. You know what? Go more power to you. Get on it. I don't want you to hear. Uh, I don't want to hear a word when I have a castle and you can't get across the moat. <laughs> Let them be stupid. Okay. Risk assessment and management. Uh, in game theory, understanding risk and reward, it does. I mean, obviously, this helps you strategize. What are the risks and what are the rewards? Like, what's the the the, the skew here? What what am I what am I having to offer up? What is the return? But remember that humans are prone to the gambler's fallacy. You know, that like I'm due believing that if something happens more frequently now, it will happen less frequently in the future. You flip a coin, you say, oh, 20 heads in a row. The next 20 are going to be tails. No, every single flip is its own unique moment with its own unique outcomes. The past is not indicative of future. Not. So uh, don't don't fall into that gambler's fallacy. Right. Um, Always address risks based on current and reliable information. Reliable, not noise. So you can't be a TA person and look at charts, but it's important to understand what happened in the past. It may influence the, the amount or the dexterity of choices that people have now, but it doesn't determine the choice. Remember, nobody has a crystal ball, otherwise they'd have all the money, and no one has all the money, right? Um, and then finally, long-term planning and goal setting. So game theory, one of the major kind of, well, one of the benefits of game theory is it teaches us the importance of thinking far, far ahead, as far as we can, planning for the future moves, not only our own future moves, but everybody else's future moves. This is what gets us into Nash equilibrium, which I'm going to cover in a second. Um, and this is what you're always trying to assess. What is the Nash equilibrium of a situation? But when you, as far as goal setting and long-term planning, I mean, obviously compound interest, if you have long-term um, kind of mindset, the benefit of compound interest is, is, is ridiculous. So when you set clear long-term goals, avoid falling into the sunk cost fallacy. And this is where you continue a behavior as a result of previously invested resources. Um, meaning, um, you need to learn to let go of past losses or mistakes that you made and focus on the future goals and strategies this moment forward, every moment, right? Um, and so if you kind of understand and slowly start to apply these principles, keep in mind, you know, these cognitive biases, but if you start to apply them, you're going to be better equipped to navigate all of these really complex situations that pop up in our daily lives which is going to make us better at navigating investment decisions, investment markets. Whether you're thinking about money or stuff that's going to grow in a garden or which line to choose at a movie theater for popcorn or whatever, like, or whether you, sh you should eat popcorn, all that, like all of these things influence our lives. It's not just money decisions. Game theory is not just about money. Game theory is about the strategic interdependence of players in a game. That is all of us all the time, everywhere. So you want to be thinking in game theory terms, understanding that cognitive biases are the, are the things that push us off of the path of good decision-making, stay rational, and 
start to live a smarter existence. And then that's going to propagate into your financial existence. Does that make sense? So um, let me spend just a second and talk about Nash Equilibrium, and then we will call it a day. Um, you probably hear me say Nash Equilibrium a lot. And um, imagine – Imagine you and your friend are trying to decide where to eat and you love pizza, but you want, you're not sure if they like pizza or not, but you want to make sure you both enjoy the meal. So if you both choose without considering the others like food preferences, you're going to end up at different places. Nash equilibrium is like finding a spot where you're both happy, like tortillas, like, okay, you are, um, you like meat. I'm a vegan. I'm not. But w what if we find a place that has like both in, in, okay. Ooh, Nash equilibrium. So you, you, the Nash equilibrium is each person is happy with their choice given other people's choices where neither of you would want to change your mind after hearing the other's decision. Does that make sense? Where everybody's made the best decision possible and no player can make any better decision on the board based on everyone else making their best decision. That's an Nash equilibrium. So let's break it down into like a real life scenario. I guess, I guess that was a real life scenario, but like, let's think about traffic. Um, everyone chooses their route to minimize travel time, right? Like you have your path. I'm going to go here, here, left here. I'm going to avoid that. Whatever. Those stop signs suck, whatever. So a Nash equilibrium occurs when all the drivers have picked their routes and no single driver can reduce their travel time by switching to any other route. It's like everyone is stuck in a pattern that no one can benefit from individually changing. We've all found our best win-win. Yeah, Sean, our best win-win. There is a best win-win, right? In decision-making, Nash Equilibrium is about predicting other people's choices and adjusting yours for the best aggregate outcome, like playing uh, rock, paper, rock, paper, scissors, right? If you know the other person's choice, you could win every time, but in reality, you don't. You're trying to outthink them while trying to, you know, imagine them trying to outthink you. So the equilibrium is where you both make a choice, assuming the other is also trying their best to win. You always assume everyone in the game is doing their best, their rational best, their, their sane best to win, right? So in, in, in daily life, this happens a lot because you have, People like negotiating chores, like if you have roommates or whatever, or um, family members, companies deciding on prices for their products, but thinking about other companies similarly competing with their products and pricing. And so everyone's looking for the sweet spot where their decision is the best response to everybody else's best choice. Understanding Nash equilibrium can help us realize that our choices are often interconnected which I mean, by now you guys should all know this, but when you consider what other people want to do, you can make better decisions and sometimes find that there is a perfect balance where everyone is as happy as they can possibly be given the situation. And so again, this is strategy, prediction, a little bit of psychology. It's all kind of mixed in, but you know, the next time you're making a decision and there's multiple people involved, Think about how a Nash equilibrium can occur and how you might be part of a bigger game and how you might imagine everybody's best possible choice all at the same time where no one can do any better without stifling somebody else. So like the ultimate kind of win, win, win. Yeah. Okay. So that's just a little uh, brain food for you. Stay in school. Don't do drugs. Don't do anything. My porn solvent drunk, strung it on meth. Grandmother wouldn't do. Um, we will see you tomorrow for uh, for digital investor. We'll do our uh, year predictions, our price predictions, all that kind of stuff. That should be pretty fun. Um, so yeah, let's rock and roll on all that. And for those of you that are interested, if you're an accredited investor and you want in on Angel seed round or early round equity and token opportunities in the artificial intelligence and cryptocurrency space, schedule an interview at nickblacknext.com. In life, you can either be really good, really lucky, or just be first. Being first is so much easier. 
Schedule a digital private client interview today at nickblacknext.com. Are you tired of all the uneducated noise you're getting from the droves of YOLO meme coin peddling douchebag gurus out there trying to use you as their exit liquidity? Would you rather learn a competent university-level set of skills that will guide you in managing and investing for the rest of your life? Join us three days a week at Digital Investor. Develop your knowledge of game theory, cognitive bias, macroeconomics, monetary theory, investment theory, psychology of the crowds, and more. For more info on Digital Investor and how it can help you, reach out at nickblacknext.com. Are you tired? Yes, of course you're tired. You've heard it. You're tired of hearing it. Thank you.